So joining us now, of course, she is the first ever signee of Athletes Unlimited. She is the chairperson of Athletes Unlimited Player Executive Committee. She finished third in 2020, participating in year two. Olympian now, bronze medalist on Team Canada, captain of Team Canada, and another title, assistant coach at San Diego State. I speak of Victoria Haywood, who joins us now in the circle. That's just some of your resume titles. You know, we couldn't, I couldn't go through all of them. Those are the relevant ones. Those are the ones that matter right now. <laughs> well, let's talk about first year two of Athletes Unlimited. Obviously, I mentioned you were the first signee of the league. How do you feel about the league here going into your halfway point here in t- year two? Uh, what's been your thoughts here now in year two and, and some of the things you've learned from year one that you've moved to year two, et cetera? Yeah, um, I mean, it's incredibly competitive and it's more competitive than last year, which is exactly what we want. We want to keep continuing to get the the best players and really be the best 60 players in the world. So um, to have the player pool we do now and just people coming in mid-season form from either preparing for the Olympics or helping teams prepare for the Olympics. So a lot more people had a lot more games under their belts compared to last year. So I think we're seeing that in the quality of the play. Um, and just continuing to build on some of the things that we were really good at last year, which was just having a really great kind of organizational culture within the whole league and the connection between players and just the excitement you have around the team names and, um, each team's theme for the week. And so just really building on the creativity of that to make it fun for the fans. And then it's been awesome to have fans in the stands and be able to connect with them after what feels like forever. So um, it's been awesome. And it's been so fun to just be able to compete uh, and be back in this environment. It's a strange question, but it's kind of unique, especially in your case and some of the Olympians case. Was there an adjustment period to having fans in, in the it, it was that I mean, what's that like to have fans? Yeah, it sounds weird. But you know, like you said, the Olympics didn't have fans. It's been a while you didn't have fans last year. What's that been like to have fans? Has that been an adjustment? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, it makes it more exciting. There are certain times where I was on the, um, I had, I was mic'd up during the game and trying to communicate with the press box. And for the first time, like there was so much fan energy. I couldn't hear them. I was like talking to Eric and I was like, I can't hear you. There's, there's planes, there's whatever the, so encountering some problems logistically that we didn't have to deal with before. So that's a great problem to have. Just it's loud. It's fun. Um, and it feeds up with the players. I think we've seen more extra inning games. We've seen more close ball games. And I do think the fans have an impact on that and the energy that you're feeling. Um, luckily we were able to have fans, um, as the Canadian wild and rent one. So we did have a few games of, of really awesome fans and, and them being really connected, but, um, definitely a different experience in, in Tokyo, not having them, but again, we were there for the competition. So the fans would have been amazing, but the game itself you still felt all the feels, the energy, the excitement, the nerves, all of that in game. So um, it's, it's, it's been really fun and just being able to connect with them. Not much changes in the middle of the game and in your process, but after the game to go give autographs and go connect with people and just see how excited they are to watch Athletes Unlimited is, is even after a really crap day at the, at the plate or losing points or whatever, sure. it doesn't matter when you go see the fans and just get to show those moments. Thing I've enjoyed about the broadcast and the telecast, obviously Eric College, Danielle Laurie on the call, but you all like get mic'd up. Uh, even talk to them during the game at times, and obviously the post game. But you're also mic'd up during the game. I think you've been mic'd up as well. Mm-hmm. What's that like to be mic'd up, and how much of that conversation was there a big convincing of the players to hey, you know, let's let's show our personality, let's kind of be, allow yourself to mic yourself up and, and you know showcase yourself. It was that a big convince you had to do with the players, or were they everybody on board from the get go? I think there are people that don't want that either, whether they call it a distraction or they don't really want to do it. And, and here it's really, it's take it. If you want it, if you want to have the conversation, some people are ready to do it. I'll do it anytime. I love, you know, chatting with my girl, Danielle in the bot in the booth. And just, um, I think it's fun to give the fans a little bit of an inside scoop, especially when I was a captain, we talk about, Hey, what about this decision? And, and kind of talking through some of those things I thought was really fun. Um, I just think as a fan, I would have loved to hear what my favorite players were doing in the moment. So I think that's how a lot of us view it is I want to, I would, I would love to have people have access to me. And so that's, that's, it's not hard for a lot of us to do it, but then, then again, there's a lot of money on the line. There's a lot of points on the line. So if people want to just focus hundred percent on what they're doing and not be distracted for an inning, then, um, we can't blame them. So, um, 
it, there's, there's really kind of even amount of people who would love to do it and don't, I will have to say the most impressive ones I've seen have been Gwen Speckis and Aubrey Monroe calling pitches <laughs> while talking, while communicating with their pitchers. So I think, I mean, for to see that as, as a fan of the sport is pretty incredible. I'm not surprised though with those two, especially Gwen. She's not yeah. shy. Oh, yeah. She she yeah. she she could multitask a lot. You could multitask a lot. You've obviously been a captain. You finished in the top four last year, third. You've been the captain. You've had to make the selections, where it's obviously a lot of people always will scrutinize every time you have the four captains pick every week. You've also been on the other side where you've not been the captain. You're waiting to be selected. Describe that the two experiences now that you've gone through it. What's it like to be the captain and the pressure to pick a team? But then also being on the other side where you're waiting to get picked. Yeah, I mean, what an honor to be one of the top four and have the the pressure of picking your own team. Um, I think there's a lot of nerves because you're facilitating a lot of people's decisions and there's points on the line, there's money on the line. This is some people's livelihood to a certain extent. So um, I took the pressure of wanting them to have a really good experience and wanting to win and wanting to win for everybody on the team. Um, a lot to heart that that weighed on me a lot. Um, but ultimately when you're in the, when you're in the draft room, I mean, some of these decisions you are splitting hairs with just incredible players. So you really can't go wrong. Even people will say, oh, this team drafted well, this team didn't draft well. Like our games have been so competitive and there have not been teams that go out and really dominate and, and, and are so much better than others. Right. So, um, with our competitive player pool, it's been, it's been fun, I think, for people to draft and, and just see different dynamics and see how other people draft. So um, it's been fun to get more captains in the mix. So then on the other side of that, as somebody waiting to be drafted, it's very nerve wracking. <laughs> um, you think that you've strategized. I mean, as a captain, you have a strategy, a general strategy of kind of who am I as a player who compliments me as a player who, what are, as a, as an outfielder, I need pitching. I need infielders. I need people that can hit me in. I'm a get on base person. I need people who are going to hit me in. So then now we have some big hitters, uh, at the top of the leaderboard. So who do they value? Are they going pitcher? Are they going people who are going to get on base for them to hit them in? So you kind of are, are analyzing as a type of player, who do I fit in with? Who, um, is going to value the type of player that I am for what round? So, um, it's, it's sweating. It's, it's exciting. You don't know where you are. And then the zoom room pops in and you're super excited to accept. So, um, it's been fun just having more people and more, the drafts have all been, um, completely different experiences, which is really fun because you truly don't know where you're going to go. And, and that's that mystery of, of the draft, which is fun. I've always been curious, like, because when you're getting selected, you're thinking in your mind, wait a minute, I selected you in this round. Why are you not picking me? Is there some like mind games here? Or are you like, hey, you know, I'll remember this next time I'm captain uh, where, you know, things like that. Is there any gamesmanship no. going on? No, no, I think more so like strategy of, OK, she's going this first. She's going this first round. She's OK, then she probably needs this. So she doesn't need an outfielder right now. So I can kind of turn my brain off to that. I don't think she's going to draft me. There have been a few times where I'm like, oh, I don't think she's going to draft me. Tori was a great example. She already had Haley McClenney and I was like, oh, she's not going to draft me. She doesn't need another outfielder. And I saw the draft room pop up and I was like, yes, team blue, let's do it. It'll be fun. So um, even then, some people will surprise you with the decisions that they're making because everyone's got a little bit of a, of a different strategy. And then um, if you're in the unlimited club, you can get behind the scenes looks in the draft room and kind of hear some of the dialogue and hear some of those conversations. So if anyone's done that, you can see, you know, a few people get in there and they're like, Hey, what do you think about this person? Or, Hey, this person's looked really good in BP or I think this person's getting hot. So you really kind of, um, get those insights. Speaking of Miss Gwen Speckus, you were just there, talking there, about. She's hey, right there hey. hopping in. Hello. How's it going? How's it going? Going good. Nice cameo from Gwen. I like that. It's very good. Right, that, it no, it's, it's all beautiful. Right there. It's beautiful there. Now I'm tell you enemy this week. That's right. She is. Now tell the audience where they can find more info. You just mentioned the Unlimited Club. Just tell, talk more about that for the audience that may not be aware. Yeah. So we have um, just uh, access to different levels of, of membership within Athletes Unlimited. And so um, the Unlimited Club has different levels. And with a paid membership, you can get into the draft room. You can vote for MVPs at the end of each game and have unprecedented access to your favorite players. So um, it's definitely something you should get into. There is a free level as well, but um, AUProSports.com has all that info. Also got a lot of great merchandise. I'm wearing a merchandise right now representing 
Okay. A legend. I can get on board with that because I'm Team Osterman this week. This but week. We can get you a Hayward one there, Eric. I don't know what's going on. Uh, hey, let's make that work. Well, the reason I love, for a reason I got Cat Osterman, it was two reasons. On our seat, my season team, because on our the show, me and Victor, we do a, a season team. We have four players for the whole season. You're on my team with Cat. You were my second pick. She was the first pick. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is she's retiring. So I'm like, this is the last chance I could get Cat gear. I don't yeah. sense you're done t- playing. So I've, Eric, I've got who's time. Keeping my on, Eric. Um, you're, well, you're on uh, Victor's team. He took you. He took you. Victor's team. You know, he took it before. It was a tough choice. Uh, but what I love about it, I do love the gear. And I do want you to talk about it. Because pl- I, I want to know about the players' involvement in the merchandise as far as the gear. Because this has got your name on it, on all of your players. And so I can tell you guys, I collect a lot of jerseys. This is pretty sweet. It's pretty comfortable. It's better than some even some of the pro sports in, other, in, the, in the other leagues. Just talk about the involvement the players have behind the scenes. Yeah, so we have a player executive committee. Um, Gwen and I are both on it. I'm the chairperson of it, along with um, Haley Wagner, Jasmine Jackson, and Troy Vidalis. So we're um, involved with a lot of the decisions. I think year one, our primary decision or kind of something we were focused on was getting uniforms, and our priority was Nike. So that getting that situated was was one of our big goals. Um, and then I think we're, we're still trying to navigate that that line between really good quality and just access to all these different things. So we want um, mock uniforms. We know those are in the works. We've, we've, we've established that we want those, but we don't want to compromise quality of just pumping everything out. So we love the draft shirts. Um, A lot of the gear is really awesome. You can buy online and in the stadium. So um, if we have an idea for something, we'll submit it. So um, a volleyball player in a speech had mentioned this I am unlimited and we made a t-shirt out of it, which sold really well, which was pretty cool. So um, topics kind of that come out through all the sports, um, our media team and our management team do a really good job of helping those become kind of real for us as athletes to enjoy. We just had um, a, a Mexican heritage night shirt. So we all wore those for practice. So that was um, run by us as a concept and, and we loved it and we wanted to help celebrate that. So that went through. We have much more creative people than us specifically creating the ideas, but um, we are involved in those decisions, which is awesome. And I'm looking forward to having some uh, some mock jerseys because I know I know kids are, are excited for those in their favorite color. Um, but it's been it's been fun to, to have a little behind the scenes look on that side and see kind of the direction that it could head in the future. And then um, profits from from those um, are hopefully eventually gonna be something that players can, as a collective, make money on. So we do get a cut of profits made through Athletes Unlimited at the end of the season. And so that's obviously something in mind um, as a group. So we're all working together to help grow the brand. Take me back to when you joined Athletes Unlimited, you were the first signee. Take me through that process. How did it all come about? And did you have in mind being as involved with it as you are? You're like, you're, you're the you know, player executive committee. Was that something you were that just happened? Was it just materialized as you were talking? What take me through that process when you joined? Sure. So it all started with, I mean, a phone call from Sherry Kempf, who was at the time the commissioner of the MPF. And she called um, Gwen Speckis, Haley Wagner, and I up to New York City and um, we were pitched this idea and there was just a very, um, like a, a very clear moment of Gwen and I looking at each other being like, we're in, let's do this. Like, this sounds awesome. And, uh, I think we had a, a two hour meeting slot. We ended up going far over that. We ended up talking for like four hours, pitching these ideas, kind of diving into what it could be. And then, um, I guess we didn't really know what the idea of the player executive committee would be at the time. It it wasn't named that it wasn't um, as defined as it is. We basically created the boundaries for that through conversations of, okay, what do we want this to look like? So originally it was four and then we had three and then we wanted to add two more and we had people leave, we had people come. So it was, it was just a very organic process of figuring out what worked best for our sport. And once we developed it, we were able to model it through, volleyball and lacrosse and now it's really become um, a solid group we meet weekly to talk about at first rules what do we want this league to look like how do we want it to be the same sport we love how do we want it to be new and different and exciting Um, so we were very involved in those conversations and now that it's kind of 
a little bit more of a well-oiled machine and people have an expectation, we're getting into much smaller conversations about, you know, video replay. What rules do we want to kind of monitor? Do we want to be able to flash the four for the intentional walk or actually have to throw the pitches and talking about game management, talking about um, broadcast and, and much more kind of high level um, details. So um, it's been quite an experience. It's been an incredible learning experience um, just to see what goes on behind the scenes and super grateful to, to be a part of it and continue to be a part of it. What's the biggest thing maybe you've learned that you didn't know about either softball or maybe the things that go behind the scenes to make things happen that what you didn't know going in? Oh man, how many people it takes to make this the show go. Um, the Athletes Unlimited roster is pretty small in terms of um, the executive team. So just the amount of work these that our executive team does and, and the PEC does, honestly, I, I didn't think it would be as hard um, as it has been. Um, just to see how many people are on staff every day to make our games go the way they go. Every day there are new people who I'm like, who's this person? How are they involved? Just the investment that um, John and Jonathan and Athletes Unlimited has made in general for us is um, it just really blows me away how many people are invested in in helping this grow and helping it be the best experience not only for athletes but also for for fans and and people a part of it. One of the things, of course, you're on Team Osterman this week as we talk. Mm -hmm. You got to be with Danielle Laurie, obviously in the Olympics. So you get to you get to say you've played now with two icons in the cat. And Danielle here at the end, Kat's going to retire here. Danielle just announced her retirement officially. What's it like being around the two of them? Two of the great sports stories, really, coming out of retirement, long layoffs to make one more Olympic trip. Both have families and things like that that they kind of had to put aside to focus on the training stuff. Just being around the two of them, what's it been like for you being around these two? They're two of the greats in the history of the sport. Yeah, um, it's been awesome. I mean, uh Fortunately, I mean, I feel if you had told me, have you, if you had ever told like 15 or 16, 17 year old Victoria that I would ever play with them, let alone be someone they want on their team and be like a, a staple person for them in a lineup, I would tell you that you were off your rocker, right? So I've been super grateful for those relationships. They've both um, been huge parts of my development in Athletes Unlimited and, and with Team Canada with Danielle. Um, they're very similar and, and they're just, they're just competitors and you love to compete against them as much as you love to compete with them, just because it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a grind. And that's what you love about the sport is that just competitor against competitor and whoever executes better that day wins. So, um, I've loved playing with Kat here. Um, obviously I've loved playing with Danielle and just, going through the grind with, with her and to have her here in the booth is really special. We still get to share a lot of moments and still talk the game together. Um, but they're, they're both competitive. They want to be the best and I will run through a wall for, for those two and just, and they play the game the right way. And I'm, I'm so happy to be able to be in the outfield when, when they're on the mound. And such a great representation of the sport represent the game. You know, Danielle's doing it on the broadcasting side, as you mentioned, Kat's been great spokesman. I would imagine you picked up on some of those things too, because you've been a great spokesperson as well for the sport as well. Uh, but you have two here that you probably have learned, picked up some things from. Yeah, I think, I think as a softball community, we all try to do what's best for the sport. And so um, I'm honored that you just said that I try to do my best and just, we all acknowledge that the sport has given us a lot. And I think that's where it starts from is just that place of, um, gratitude and trying to give back to something that gave us so much in our lives. So whether that was college education, Olympic opportunities, traveling relationships, um, now without the athletes unlimited opportunity to create something new to give back to our partners through give lively. Um, I think just that kind of, as you get older, that sense of gratitude and that sense of community and connection has definitely been something that we've, um, that they speak of a lot that I've obviously experienced as well and has impacted me a lot. So I think just connecting on different levels is, is what makes this league really special and what makes our community as a, as a softball community really special too. There's a lot of Huskies in Athletes Unlimited on the field. Uh, in fact, I want to say early in the year, right? You're all on the same team at one point earlier this year on the first uh, round or close four. to it. We had four of them on the same team, which was pretty awesome. Four or five, but oh, yeah. How do we not get all five? How do we not get all five? 
I don't know. They're too good. They're going too early in the draft. That's the issue. What What is that like? Uh, because it's different, you know, eras here. I mean, Sis Bates, for example, is a rookie, et cetera. But yeah. what's that like, that kind of bond there? Is there like some friendly trash talking among the alums there? Or what, what's that like? I know Coach Tar recently visited and uh, mm-hmm. w- catch uh, some of your guys playing there. What What's that like to have that representation? Um, it's really cool. I mean, it's cool to see all of them who I've watched. I mean, I had the opportunity to play with Ali Aguilar and Courtney Gano at Washington, but I've been such fans of um, Sis and Taryn as they've played and grown up through UW. I was a fan and they watched they were fans of Washington wine to come to Washington when I played. And so there's definitely a connection there. Um, that's much deeper than just, you know, meeting and playing together for a week. And then there's just this shared expectation of what we know of each other. And, um, that's instilled from coach tar and just our expectations of, of each other as softball players, whether it's on the field or in the dugout or how you behave as a teammate. So it's very easy to just hop on a team with them and feel like you've played with them before. So that's been such a fun experience knowing them as players and then just getting to kind of realize like, it's exactly what I thought it would be. It's awesome. It's fun. It feels very comfortable. And um, I will say people that weren't dog fans before this year are becoming dog fans because of the group of five. And I'm sitting with the duck right here. That would agree. I like, is that a good nickname there? Group of five Huskies, something like group of five dogs. I mean, we got some, yeah. we got some material you can work with there. You do. It sounds like a girl band in the making. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's probably accurate. Yes. We're speaking with Victoria A. Wood here on In The Circle. Now, if you're not busy enough right now, you're busy as it is with all the stuff you're doing with Athletes Unlimited. You decide to get back in your coaching. Mm-hmm. You're now the new assistant at San Diego State. We just, you know, we, I just spoke to Stacy Newman about it. You're going to be running the offense. I know you were just on with Jenna Becerra, and you talked about that, like you were just going to move to San Diego regardless. Mm-hmm. Like you weren't even thinking about coaching. So just take me through this mindset because I thought you were done coaching the last time I saw you in person. That was the mindset I thought. But here you are, a great opportunity though uh, at San Diego State. So how did it all play out? Um. Yeah. Great. It's it's just still such a wild kind of experience. Um, I did think I was finished coaching. Uh, I just was really enjoying my experience in athletes unlimited and thought I might dive even further into developing the league and partnerships and just kind of taking a more corporate route, but, um, just kind of through the Olympic journey and working with some of my teammates and, um, kind of, I I wanted to move to San Diego. I fell in love with the area. I really wanted to do it. And just in conversations with Jen Salling about kind of what's next, the I remember saying out loud, like if something opened up in San Diego, I'd really have to think about it because I'm I'm feeling this pull to kind of get back into it. But I want to prioritize myself for once and go somewhere I want to be and kind of start the transition from from this Olympic life to whatever was next. And for me, that involved getting in, getting to a new place and kind of creating a little bit of distance from what I've been used to for the last few years in Florida. Um, and so then she, she messaged me the next day, just about this opportunity. And it was like, wow, I, this feels like this is too good to be true right now. Like what are the odds this opened up and this all worked out. And, um, there was this opportunity to, to work for someone that I'd really admired as a softball player. And when I grew up watching the 2008 Olympics and, grew up watching Stanford university play. Like I used to love watching UCLA and I dreamed of going to UCLA. And, um, so it just checked so many boxes of, wow, this is someone I really admire. This is someone that I know I'm going to learn from. And this is a place I know I can thrive and then softball and all that good stuff aside, how are Victoria as a human is also going to thrive there. And it's going to put me in a good position as a softball player to continue competing. So it was just kind of like all these boxes are being checked. This feels like something's meant to be. So I'm going to go ahead and go for it. And um, Stacey Newman has been so awesome at just allowing me to continue to compete here and continue to learn, continue to stretch myself, continue to challenge myself here while also staying connected to the hitters um, at San Diego state. And it's been an awesome experience so far. And in a few short weeks, we'll be back at it full steam on the field, just back like we never left. What's amazing is you're going to take over the offense for her. She's going to handle the pitching. And she talked about handing that to you and trusting you with that. What does that mean to you? Here's one of the greatest hitters in the history of the sport, one of the greatest players, but also hitters in the history of the game, one of the great hitting minds in the sport. 
and she's handing you her offense and trusts you with that offense. I know she'll still kind of obviously be around and you could, you know, you'll both be on the same page on that. But that's just, that's got to mean a lot to you and the respect that you have earned as a coach that they trust you to run her offense. Yeah, it's incredibly humbling. Um, and it's going to be a challenge for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the challenge. I'm ready to, you know, go all in. And I know that and, th- and that's also something I know that they're coming with a really good base and a really good, like foundational understanding and they're good hitters they've performed in the past. So that honestly was exciting to me of like, I know I'm getting into something where we're not working from square one. They've worked with someone who knows what they're doing and, and just maybe we needed some new ideas. And, and so I think, I think having two minds working on an offense is awesome and Mia as well, the other assistant was a slapper and, and is competitive and knows all knows how to put pressure on a defense. So I think the more minds you have going is, is the sky's the limit for just like challenging hitters, new ideas, all that stuff. So I was really humbled when, when that opportunity came up and I'm excited to, (laughs) (laughs) I live in a circus. I'm excited to, um, for the challenge of, of rising to that. Okay. There's an expectation that I have to come in and perform and um, I'm, I'm ready for that as I kind of transition into this next stage of my life. A great program though. You're entering with a lot of talented players, high expectations. I know in talking to coach Newman, their expectations, trying to win the mountain West conference. What's that been like for you to get to know them from a distance? Cause obviously you're playing at athletes unlimited. I know there's a lot of zooms and things mm-hmm. going on with that. She was, she was telling me she's watching every at bat of yours now very closely but so what's that been like for you as far as getting to know them from a distance? I think, I mean, unfortunately, this kind of communication is the expectation now. So I think it's happening at a time where connecting over Zoom is totally normal. That's how they learned all of last year. That's how they're, that's how this generation right now is conditioned to learning. So um, although I would never choose it, and I think that they're, but they're doing such an awesome job. It's like totally normal to just get a few nuggets on uh, zoom and go do it. And they're, um, they're all doing everything that is asked of them, which is all you, all you can do. And so I think it's, it's been much easier than I was expecting. Just the communication piece and the connection piece has, has been pretty seamless. Um, and I feel great about the foundation we're building to then be able to in-person kind of be able to build on that and feel like we didn't just waste a few weeks because it was through zoom. It really feels like we've been able to, to get after some stuff and, and uh, challenge them a little bit. Sydney ball Malone, the UCF head coach, you were the director of ops at UCF told me the thing that impressed her about you was that you took the director of ops job while you were preparing and training for the Olympics. And how you were able to multitask you were able to do your director of ops uh you know obligations and still train and the organization that you had she said she's been blown away no human she's ever met as organized as disciplined as you are where does that come from and does that help you in a situation like this where you're playing currently at athletes Unlimited, but you're also now coaching at san diego state in the meantime yeah what an awesome compliment bear ball is the best (laughs) um that just made my heart really happy Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's been one of my strengths, just, I'm really competitive. Um, and I want to get things done and I want to do them really, really well. I have high expectations for myself and others. So, um, fortunately I do have experience kind of managing lots of different things. So, um, it's been playing to those strengths and that experience of just continuing to manage those relationships and continue to, to hopefully be able to be at my best in all things. I mean, there are some days where maybe I don't have great ABs, but I can give everything to the, to the players that morning on the zoom that can really fill my bucket. So it's been honestly really great for me to be able to disconnect from what's going on here. Maybe I have a bad weekend or maybe my team loses a big game and I can go fill my bucket, talk, really feel like we we're getting something, we're being productive and then go have a great game the next day. And, and it's, it's been a, an interesting balance, but both things fill my buckets in different ways. And um, it just gets me really excited for being there. But I will definitely say my whole career, I've, I've always been one to juggle lots of things. And so uh, we're just right back at it. We're right back on that. You don't know any, anything else, right? Like, I feel like you would feel weird if you didn't have multi things going on. I think you would feel kind of like, 
what I got to do something else. Yeah. And I think that's what I had intended to do was kind of let's just slow down and we won't make any decisions about jobs or whatever until after athletes unlimited, just really slow down. And, and honestly, the minute I said that everything sped up and we just had this light life doesn't slow down sometimes. And so, um, I just feel like I would, I would have really missed out on an opportunity had I not jumped on it, um, because it really felt right. And so I was willing to put in the work to, to make it work. You played for Heather Tarr. Obviously, you were part of the 2013 Women's College World Series team in 13. You were an All-American in 14. You were on Beth Tarina's staff at LSU when they got to the Women's College World Series in 2015. What did you pick? From, what was it like playing for Coach Tarr and coaching you know, with an under coach uh, Tarina as well? And, learn, and maybe I'm sure you picked up on some things from the two of them that you apply to your coaching style now. Yeah, uh, I think they're, they're two of the best coaches in the game that goes without saying they're both incredibly successful and, and they do so in different ways. Like coach Char is very offensive. She's offensive oriented, but Washington values defense immensely. But then Beth showed a little bit, a lot more of the pitching side and um, how she manages a team while focused predominantly on the pitchers and um, does so while managing kids and a family and all of that. And that's something that I hadn't seen as a student athlete in action. So um, I, before working with Beth Trina, I didn't think that, um, a woman could have children and a family and be the highest level coach. And so I will always admire Beth for her ability to balance those things and be so good at both. So that was a really great opportunity for me to see, um, just people thriving in different ways, because when you're in one way so long, you think that's the only way, but and over the course of my career, I've been exposed to some really incredible coaches. Um, now with with Cindy Ball Malone and um, Julie Wright at Maryland and and at UMass too. Just everyone does it a little bit different. And so taking things that I love from each place, and th- and then that's been me, and that's what I take um, to San Diego State to help build there. And so um, they've had a huge impact on me, no matter how long I've 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 spent there. You didn't pick up any superstitious stuff from Coach Tarina because she's very superstitious. Did you Very pick up? Yeah, you didn't, yeah. Did you I was get... in charge of the uniforms, so <laughs> there were a few managers that we were in charge of the uniforms. And if we lost, it was like, all right, we can't wear that again. We cannot wear that again. Which, I mean, I'm not as superstitious as Beth, but when I was there, I was all in, all in. Beth, you're right. We can't wear the whites. We can't do it. Uh, but yeah, everyone's gonna have their little thing. But it's also what keeps it fun. And um, we, you know, have to take our jackets off if we didn't score or like put the jackets on and it was a rally jacket. So as a staff member who couldn't be involved kind of at the capacity of a normal coach, it was fun to be able to buy into those little things. I actually will defend her on that. I, I wouldn't wear the same polo either. If, uh, you know, if UCF lost the game, I'm switching the polo. So I, I, I'm defending her on that. Uh, but you're, you're neat because you get to say you're part of the Coach Tarina tree, which is successful, and the Coach Tar tree, which Coach Ball Malone came from. She was the assistant there coached you there coach Whitney Jones who's now the assistant at UCF it's kind of a small world here like all these pieces here what what's it like what was it like working for coach Ball Malone after she coached you at Washington and here's your teammate Whitney Jones now getting that full-time opportunity over at UCF yeah I'm so excited for Whit Jones to be able to thrive there um she has so much to offer she was with us in Athletes Unlimited as a facilitator last season so we played together for four years and then when our kind of coaching tree ways and went and pursued other things. So we were able to reconnect last season. She's such a great coach. She's such a great ambassador of the game. So to have her and coach ball back together is awesome. I cannot wait to see what they can do along with Kaya Gibson, um, their new volunteer. So a lot of Huskies down in Florida. Um, but I mean, I can't say enough good things about coach bear. She's helped me so much just in terms of we, we had a, an established relationship, um, as assistant coach player. And she was instrumental for me my first few years. She would be the person I would talk to before all my at-bats. She knew exactly how to connect with me as an athlete. And so we didn't skip a beat, kind of whatever it was, like six to eight years later, getting back together on staff. It's like, we we know what we need from each other. We know how to work really well together. And then she also knows like when I'm my best and and we know how to push each other and, and support each other when we need it. And she has been a huge moral support for me um, in the last year and a half and just even giving me the opportunity to work for her while competing and help build her program. um, 
it's been, it was such a great place for me to thrive and, and feel like I could do everything I needed to do while also, you know, putting food on the table and being able to, to survive as a professional athlete. Yeah. Or we're, we're speaking with Victoria Haywood here on in the circle. You've had a little time now, obviously the Olympics historic team Canada, first medal in the history in the Olympics in softball, you get the bronze, uh, just, you've had a little time to think about it. Have you, have you reflect on it? What, what do you think now, thinking back now a little bit away from it? I know it was only a couple months, but, uh, pretty historic. I know it wasn't what you were shooting for. You were shooting for higher. You were that close. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was such a well-played tournament one run a hit here or there we could have had a different results but still to win a bronze and bring home a, a medal to your country for the first time ever still has to mean a lot oh yeah it means a lot um it's an honor it feels it's I'll, i'm so grateful for the whole experience but i think to your point i mean we were so close and i think that's what still is just really hard to sit with is um just waking up every day for the last three or four years thinking that we could be in that gold medal game we could win a gold medal and to know that we were just we were inches away just one thing falls we were inch, we were so close so um those plays often replay in my head um but i wouldn't change anything about it um i know we worked incredibly hard i know we don't have any regrets in that so there's definitely a piece that comes with that and to be able to leave with something is really special um and it is crazy to think it's the first medal for Sapo Canada because we've been so solidly in third place winning different types of medals, but, but not enough Olympic opportunities. So, um, I feel like we made a lot of Canadians fall in love with softball. I'm hoping that, um, people across the world felt that same thing. Um, still kind of emotionally navigating what, what's, what's next after the Olympics. And I know it's something, um, a lot of the Olympic athletes are dealing with and fortunate, Fortunately here, we have a lot of people to support one another and kind of navigate this kind of next phase, what is next, but um, very proud that we were able to do something special for the country and make history, so. What's impressive, I didn't realize this till I was looking up some of this, uh, your bio. You've been with Team Canada since you were 16 years old. Like mm -hmm. you you bleed that mm -hmm. gear. Like, you know, like, you know, you know, Jen Sally, obviously he's retiring at the end and yell lawyer retired, but you're still in your prime uh what has it been like to have this journey since 09 because probably since day that day you've been thinking about this olympics it's it's so weird the olympics coach newman and i talked about it like you have all this years that you're preparing for basically a one-week tournament it just mm. come and it's just such a wild uniqueness there and you mentioned we don't know what's going to happen we hope the olympics are back in 28 that's in los angeles but that's such a long time away and that's you know that's kind of an issue from a funding standpoint with some of these countries because you don't know if you get funded and everything but you've been through this since you were 16. Mm -hmm. how how did how did that all begin when you got there in 16. um let's well, it's, it's at that point there were no thoughts of the olympics we knew that the olympics were out i entered right as a wave of olympians from 2008 had retired so um there i was playing just because i wanted to challenge myself i wanted to play at the highest level and ultimately put myself in a good position to be able to be a competitive college player and just continue to grow. And then the conversation kind of shifted to, okay, there's the potential of the Olympics. So now as a softball community, we have to work hard to put our sport back on the map to be able to be in contention for Tokyo 2020. So um, kind of to go full circle of no hope of ever being in the Olympics after, you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12, watching Olympics from home, thinking what if, but it's never going to happen to me to then the potential of getting it back in the Olympics and kind of hoping and um, kind of working with other countries and trying to grow the game and take it to places it hadn't been to then finally I was sitting, I remember I was playing with the Pennsylvania rebellion and I was sitting poolside with Stacy Porter from the Australian national team. And we found out that it was back in the Olympics. And so we both cried and we were so excited. And so just working with everyone in our softball community to make that a reality. And then even then it felt so far away of being like, I think I'll do it. I think that I'll continue to play. I, I hope so. And then actually having a time to qualify. And then, and then it was all, all systems go at that point. So um, it really, it was never like, I'm going to, play and I'm going to go to the Olympics. It was always, we never knew that was even a possibility. So I was truly just playing because I love softball. I want to be better. Um, 
I loved representing Canada and all the opportunities that brought me. And so it feels very full circle to be able to be, re to be rewarded with such an incredible life-changing experience, having really been through all these different phases and working to get there. So, um, and watching our team develop, I mean, we would never have been third best in the world and be that close be that close, competing with USA, competing with Japan, really being a force to be reckoned with. So I think those are the most proud moments of, of just having people, softball fans acknowledge like, wow, we were so close. Like, wow, you guys were a great team or wow, you were fun to watch. And just knowing all the work that went into to every piece of that over the last decade is, is that's the journey. That's the journey that that's why this is so special. Do you see yourself being involved with Team Canada even long after you're done playing as maybe a coach? You know, Laura Berg was an Olympian as a player and has stayed on with Team USA as a coach. And people have told me about you that, you know, when they think of you, it's that leadership, that ability, like in a lot of ways, you represent Team Canada a lot of ways. It'd be kind of strange if you weren't a part of it. Is that something that would interest you down the road? Is that like the furthest thing from your mind? But what, what, because it's kind of, it would be weird not to see you in the Team Canada gear. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's just hard to fathom thinking about even what this next year looks like with Team Canada, just because there are so many unknowns. To your point, funding, we don't have a coach yet. Um, so, I mean, as long as I'm playing, uh, that's a different story. But, I mean, I could definitely see myself coaching at some point. Um, I know I have a few teammates that would also love to coach, so maybe we could have an all-player coaching staff at some point. But, um yeah, I, I definitely think it's in the realm of possibility, but um, I'm I'm excited to kind of dive into this back into this coaching thing and see if it's something that I'm meant to pursue and and see if I still enjoy it as much as I did. Um, it's, all, it's also worth pointing out, Bobby, you had some adversity as a team, obviously as everybody did with team with you know COVID pushing back the Olympics an extra year that pushes back your training. You have to push your life back a further extra year. I think you all had to train in Florida for a good duration of it. And, and so, I mean, just talk about that. There was a, this was not a normal Olympics deal where, you know, you knew ahead of it. You, there was a lot of adjustments and you really had to adapt. Yeah, I mean, the world wasn't normal. So, I, but it definitely our, I mean, our entire Olympic experience wasn't normal. Um, knowing that we only had one shot. I can't tell you how many, you know, books we would read or speakers we would talk to, Olympic speakers, and they, they would always reference like, well, at my first Olympics, this, but then by my second and my third Olympics, I was this. So at my first Olympics, I was unprepared. I, I, whatever, whatever. And then by my second or third Olympics, I really caught my stride. That's when I started to reach kind of that Zen level of performance and that state of flow. And so just the, the pressure of, that's awesome that you had three chances. We don't have three chances. We have one chance. Um, for many of our teammates who, who were great leaders and role models during this time, they, they were on their second chance, but obviously separated by a really long time. Um, but I think just that added pressure of this is a one shot thing. This is an hour never thing. This isn't, oh, we'll qualify again. So I think that added pressure along with, okay, now we're having to wait next year. Now we're having to you know, train in, in different environments or not be able to, you know, connect with our teammates. We have to wear masks and social distance. We can't, you know, go escape and go see our families and reconnect. We were really, we were together for, for seven months straight, more or less, um, with little connection to family and, and many people didn't get to go home during that time. So uh, I think it brought us really close and challenged us in a lot of ways, but that connection came through for us on the softball field when it mattered. And um, I think that's why you saw such a connected and, and kind of that team you saw was because of those experiences. Eric, I can't hear you. Yeah, I, I would imagine there, uh, I would imagine that uh, you have this bond the rest of your lives with this group, kind of like family, right? The rest of the bond, because I've heard Team USA players talk about the same thing in previous Olympics, that that bond will be there forever. Yeah. And I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. And for us, I think um, just we spent so much time together and we had to live in Halifax for two months together. And we, we, we just endure it. We experienced all of the highs and lows together. And um, even when we didn't really want to be together, we were forced to be together and, and talk about things and be vulnerable and, really use one another. Um, and so
And so the trust that I have with that group of 14 other women that were on that field will be unmatched by any other group of people I ever work with. And that is incredibly empowering. And then also sad knowing that that group will never get to play again, but um, it's a, an incredible group of women. I know nobody worked harder than us. Um, so I think that all helps with the resting your head on the pillow, being proud and knowing um, we did everything we could. And sometimes our sport is so hard and sometimes things just don't fall or sometimes it's just not your day that day. Um, and so sitting with that element is, is the challenge, not any person's one decision or any person's one individual performance. We were really all in it together. And, um, I'm, I'm proud of every single one of them. And you'll get to say you have a medal and you, you've, you've now you perform at the highest level in college. You've been to the women's college world series. You've played in it. You've played now in the Olympics in the biggest stage. How do you compare those two events that when people think softball, they think women's college world series olympic stage mm -hmm. that, that's not not many could say that yeah um i think they in the moment it feels like the biggest thing ever um it's still the same game that's the beauty of it all is it's still 60 feet to first base and then you turn left and um i think that's that's been i mean in, in both of those experiences i feel really grateful that i was present and i was just in a good headspace and i could play my own game at both of those levels i think the minute you start thinking about the stage and everything, um, you start to lose, lose yourself and lose your, your competitive kind of focus and advantage. So, um, I mean, in hindsight, I mean, nothing will ever compare to the Olympic games. Uh, hopefully there will be another opportunity where we can have another Olympic games with fans and, and maybe that added pressure of fans and external things and, and, uh, all of the Olympic glory that comes with it. But, um incredibly grateful to have played on those two stages and now even to compete in athletes unlimited it, there are moments that feel like that same level of pressure just just the game and how important each thing is and and what's at stake so um that's all that's all any athlete can ask for it's just those pressure filled moments and to be able to experience those and so i'm super grateful that i get to can get to keep kind of competing in those moments and challenging myself as i get older how are you a different player now than you were, you know, your All-American year at Washington? Obviously, you're a better player. You're probably more wiser. You're probably some things you know about the game now you wish you knew when you were playing at Washington. How do you compare where you're at now to where you were uh, in, in 2013, 2014 range? Yeah. Um, I mean, in every fact, I just, with strength and conditioning, I know I'm faster, stronger. Um, I think just more of the mental game. Uh, just the work that we've put in as, as a Canadian squad on the mental side of, of um, visualizing success and just really being in the moment. I think I'm more present now than I ever was then. Um, but ultimately I'm, I'm still the same player. I think um, my strengths then are still my strengths. Now I'm, I'm a strategic. I like to think kind of two steps ahead. Um, I love the chess game that softball is, and that's where I really thrive. And now just, I'm not changing who I am. I'm just trying to develop those individual pieces of what makes me great. So continuing to study the game, my opponents, um, and then physically just trying to do my best to, to be able to sharpen my tools. Um, still trying to bring back the slap. That's, that's been a part of my game. So make sure we have all those things going. But I think, um, I think it's cool to watch yourself develop and see how far you've grown while still at your core being the same player. Cause I think that that's what made me great at one point, And that is who I am. And the further I get away from that is when I start to kind of lose, um, lose the success that got me here, I think. And you're still playing at a high level at all levels. Uh, you still got a lot to go uh, playing wise. Take me through now the rest of the season here at athletes a minute. You finished strong last year. That's how you got to third place. You're gonna, I know you're going to try to make a big push, which, you know, from my standpoint, selfish reasons, I'm very, I'll be very pleased with that if yeah, you could pull that off. But you got the rest of this year and then, you know, to the future. What's for athletes to limit? Just give me the future there because I know you're always thinking about things that you, to make it better, to grow it. What's the next step, if you will? Yeah, so um, I think we're working to, I mean, first of all, we want to finish this year successfully. Um, we have six games left, which is huge. I think this year people are really realizing how important the team win is versus individual. So I think we've really thrown the kind of 
selfish mindset on its head. And people are really seeing that it's still a team sport. And if your team loses, good luck. Um, so that that's fun that fans are really getting to know that. Um, I think the five week season has been so successful. So we're looking to expand that in the next few years to have potentially another other opportunities for people to compete, whether that's in shorter seasons or another five week season in a few years. Um, but our sport needs more opportunities for women to be prof- for women to be professionals. And so um, we're doing our best to find um, the best way to do that. We're all, while also catering to, we have a, an awesome professional league in Japan where some of the best players are playing and we have um, college players that are going to want a stage to develop and, and really see if they can see themselves as professionals. And then we have people who are having to balance coaching jobs and, and other things. And so um, really trying, trying to work with the players to navigate kind of what is the best direction for the group and how can we continue to grow while kind of servicing all these other things that we have in our softball community. Well, it helps grow the game. It helps players stay involved and play at a high level against the very best. I thought last year that was critical with the Olympics being postponed that a lot of you, you and Kat and a lot of other players that were getting ready for the Olympics got to participate in year one and maybe helped you stay sharp instead of, you know, practicing on your own. And I think staying at that high level gets you ready. And now for future players, this is the path to help you get you uh, to play an international or whatever. You got a place to play here with against the very best. Absolutely. And the play here is so competitive and um, it, it really is the best of the best. And so um, we just have to make sure we're providing environments to where people are performing our best. And I think we're seeing that right now is people playing their best softball right now. And it's, and it's fun to watch as a fan. So um, it's a challenge for us as we move forward with no Olympics and uh, hopefully keeping other people in the game a really long time. We're going to have some incredible retirements in two weeks um with Kat Osterman and, and people really leaving their legacy so I think the next few weeks are going to be really exciting and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the season pans out well and I'm excited to see you not only play the rest of this year but now back in the dugout San Diego State with coach Newman there as she mentioned four Olympians now in that dugout over there that's pretty good <laughs> that's pretty Crazy. good uh but hey congrats on that congrats on here at Athletes Limited and the job you've been doing uh thanks so much for taking the time uh, for joining us. I know it's busy, super busy for you, but uh, so appreciative. I want to make sure to tell your story because it's kind of a cool story and I wanted most of the audience to listen. So thank you so much for uh, doing this and uh, we'll do this down the road. Awesome, Eric. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.